Hello and welcome to the CX Files podcast for March 24th, 2022. I'm Mark Hillary in Sao Paulo. And I'm Peter Ryan here in Montreal, Quebec. Mark, I can't believe it's been a full week since we recorded and I was in New York celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Well, I'm sure that it, it was a lot of fun over there. Certainly it was, uh, it was great here in Sao Paulo. We've got a guest from the UK this time. Um, now, he's someone that we both know very well because we, we've met him at conferences all over the world and, and different events. Um, Ivan Kotsev, who's an analyst at Nelson Hall um, based in the UK. And I had a chat with him about some of the technologies and innovations that are driving CX forward like right now, but I think more specifically looking into the 2020s and, and you know, what, what he sees coming down the track. Um, I, I personally like took from this. I think it was very interesting that he focused a lot on product companies and manufacturers kind of transitioning into becoming service companies. Um, and he was talking about subscriptions, you know, companies like Volvo offering a subscription to have a car or Nike offering um, personalized trainers that, that you design yourself or, or get on a subscription. Um, this kind of hyper personalization and the focus on services rather than just products is really interesting. I agree. And that was my big takeaway from the discussion as well. I, I think that Ivan is probably one of the best analysts out there, in, in, at least that I've encountered in the nearly two decades that I've been working in the CX space. He really, I, I love about Ivan, he's got a 40,000 foot view of things, but he can get very granular. And he did in the interview with you over the course of the 15, 20 minutes, our listeners are going to have the opportunity of hearing. To my mind, this ability for an organization to go from being almost a transactional type relationship where you buy a car once, or you buy a pair of shoes once to one where there's an ongoing level of back and forth, an ongoing engagement between the company and the purchaser of the product or the service makes a lot of sense in terms of how effectively relationship building is going to be in 2022 and beyond. And Ivan, to my view, brought a lot of really cool insights that should be heeded by both the enterprise community as well as the outsourcers that are representing them. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, there's a lot of industries out there that have this problem of just one transaction and then never ha ever having any engagement. And I, I think that insurance is probably one of the best examples because the only no. time that you ever engage with your insurance company is they want your money at the beginning or yep. you've got a crisis, you know, you have a major problem and you need to make a claim. And those are the only times you ever engage. So, so how does the insurance company create and nurture a sort of positive relationship. It, it's really tough. Well, this is it. And I think it was either you or Ivan, I can't remember which one in the discussion used the example of somebody buying a piece of software. It used to be that you would buy, uh, say an operating system like Windows or iOS, you would get that CD, you'd stick it in and then that would be it until you bought the next one. Now there's constant updates and it's not just operating systems, but it's it's also different elements of software. Uh, it, it could be anything going from productivity to video games to music, you name it. And to my mind, what it's doing is it's demonstrating that there is this need that the organizations that are providing these different products and services need to be able to get in touch with the people that are making these purchases. But equally speaking as consumers, I think if it's done properly, we appreciate that level of engagement. And a great example is Nike with the personal trainers as somebody who's into fitness and as somebody who undertakes training on a regular basis. I would love to have the access to a personal trainer that Nike would be able to recommend or to provide or to be able to give me feedback on what I need to do. If it's done properly, it can be done really, really well. And that's a big part of the whole CX dynamic now, being proactive. Yeah, yeah. And I think that um, for the past few years, we've looked at this development of cloud services, everything as a service. Um, but a lot of the focus has been on the revenue model, the idea that we're moving from payment upfront to subscriptions. And I think we've focused less on how does that actually impact the customer relationship with a brand that, that changes this kind of model. Uh, and, I, and I think that, that that's that was good about this conversation that we've really kind of focused in on that. How do you change that kind of ongoing relationship and how does it help you build a 50 year relationship with a customer? 
Yeah, exactly. And and that's the whole thing. It's about building that long-term revenue stream. And this is what I think that you get into the weeds with Ivan on. And it's a topic that I've been fascinated with for quite some time, but I'm seeing real traction with enterprises across verticals now. Okay, so let's go straight over to the conversation I had earlier with Ivan Kotzev from Nelson Hall. What are the major CX trends that, that Nelson Hall and yourself are sort of looking at um, for this year and next year? And, and I guess some of this is going to be around the, the recovery and the next normal and this idea that we're entering a sort of post-pandemic era. But, but what, what is it that you're talking to your clients about right now? Thanks, Mark. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to join the podcast uh, I've been following for, uh, from the first year. Well, things are very dynamic. Uh, and that's a positive, uh, I think. I expect there'll be um, a couple of a couple of changes. Uh, one is around the rebalancing of the delivery network um, of the providers. I see a lot of new sites being opened um, while organizations are kind of downsizing some of their physical facilities, their existing network, and reallocating part of their business from offshore to nearshore or onshore. For example, growth in Central America and the Caribbean for the U.S., uh, replacing some of the work from the Philippines and India. And, and certain markets are experiencing a boom, um, you know, Egypt, Turkey, South Africa, Jamaica. All these are uh, high growth areas. Another side, um, somewhat separate, is that within the industry itself, there is a, there is a continuing consolidation um, from the providers from different players. Um, many of them are acquiring um, domain-specific capabilities, especially around digital experience and CX consulting. And, and this consolidation um, of the market is a natural evolution. So I think it's to an extent even overdue because the development of um, all these automation technology, omni-channel, cloud migration, um, this multi-shore, multi-country delivery uh, or require quite sizable, significant inv- funding. And I expect a number of those large scale deals to continue. Um, I, I think there are several IPOs in, in planned uh, in 2022 and 2023. And but, the last but not least is the, the challenge with, uh, with CX talent shortage and labor cost inflation. Uh, I know a topic you regularly cover on the podcast. The good news is that many of the CX uh, clients increasingly value the employee experience and even to the extent to factor it in the outsourcing terms, while the leading um, CX management, CX services players are experts in the space. They, they have a lot of knowledge and experience with end-to-end employee lifecycle management, including for remote work, and, and they use a, a ton of um, advanced different HR tools and models to, to achieve that. That's interesting because you mentioned there about the importance of the the employee experience. And I think that the last time we were talking about some of the ongoing trends, you said that augmenting agents and and giving them better tools to be able to help customers was going to be a really important development. So is is that still something we should be watching for this year? Absolutely. Um, as we eliminate we kind of automate and self-service um, the simpler, lower value, repetitive interactions, what's left for the for the human to support are the more complex, uh, more involved conversations. And for an agent to add value uh, in this you know, support or sales conversation, they need a whole range of platforms and assistance and tools to, to navigate what's on the on the other end is the increasingly kind of complex product and services um, ecosystem of companies. There are many shifting um, business models, including the merging of products and services, even for commodities, such as running shoes. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, On Running and Cyclone, which offer a subscription model for for running shoes, and they're backed by Roger Federer. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Or or, (laughs) cool cool stuff, right? And they're, on the other end, there is kind of big, Ticket items such as new cars, and if you think how we shop for you know our personal vehicles, we increasingly do it over apps and online um, virtual showrooms, and the dealerships are becoming more experiential centers. 
so to active so, so to offer this effective support um, for these new businesses, these new business models, the front office, the, the customer experience um, function we will inevitably need to enhance and empower the agent with all those technologies. Okay, so that's really because um, we, we're not talking about the customer journey as this kind of um, customer purchases a product and then calls because they have a problem. You're, you're saying that, uh, let's say the example of Volvo, uh, you know, I, I saw that Volvo now does a subscription service and it includes mm. the, the cost of the car, the cost of the insurance, the cost of the maintenance, you know, it's all rolled into one monthly fee. Um, so that means I have a completely different type of relationship with Volvo compared to just buying a car in a one-off transaction. So, so is, that, is that what you're saying, that there's, there's this sort of evolving complexity of how the agent needs to understand the customer? Exactly. So if you think of the whole subscription model for software, you used to buy a CD way back when you start us at home, and that's the only you know, interaction with this company until we get the new version, the updated uh, edition now it's a subscription model where you constantly interacting this, this happens across all products and services what what you mentioned with volvo um it, it happens with you know with items as i said with, with running shoes that we never considered um that are part of a ongoing engagement relationship with with a brand so because of this when we provide support as an industry we are supporting this ongoing relationship not a one-off transaction yeah, yeah. And, and it seems that um, often along this more modern digital customer journey, uh, I, I mean, as you mentioned, there's a lot of automation. Uh, people have um, responded to the greater self-service. Um, and there just seems to be less human interaction between the, the brand with their, an agent in a contact center and the customer. I mean, is there is there still a role um, for that that human level of interaction? Um, and I'm thinking of things like you know cross selling and upselling. Surely that sort of area is better handled by a human than a than a bot that just says you know click here to make a purchase. Yes, and, and I'll build on that absolutely for for sales interactions. We we know that the, the human is you know can can add value significantly but i'm seeing this across other kind of lines of businesses because if if the last two years um a lot of companies had to quickly fix stuff they they had to quickly uh, respond to massive volumes the um you know the unpredictable patterns of this volume and they you know quickly resolve to you know intelligent IVRs, smart IVRs, you know, uh, deploy customer facing bots or, or enhance their self-service portals or, or add functionality for them to their mobile apps. Uh, I think the thinking now for a lot of clients is that this is part of a larger picture, the larger CX strategy, uh, because if you downsize your physical store presence, if you debranch as banks are doing, then you, you lost the opportunity to interact with the customer to learn from them and also to you know to be, bring uh, to build loyalty or potentially uh, you know upsell and cross sell them. So as a result, these support conversations that we have over the phone or you know messaging or social media are becoming quite valuable for brands. And the outcome of this, I see a lot of the a lot of investments from CX services providers in. Um, different instruments so let's say real-time sentiment analytics with the likes of nice uh, coal miner genesis you know talk desk lobby you name it variant of course variant of course and, and the goal is to improve operational performance but also to understand the customer needs and feedback we are moving to kind of 100 percent interaction recording and analysis and the use of those sample recordings and the use of kind of just a sample of recordings is becoming kind of an outdated practice. And, and the whole voice of customer analytics, the whole customer feedback management is growing super fast because companies struggle to keep up with the changing customer preferences behaviors. You know, we as consumers modified at least some way uh, on how we shop and how we um, interact with companies over the last two years. So the, the need to constantly listen to the market and the customers is growing exponentially. Yeah, and just as you were, I mean, and just as you were saying that, I was, I was just thinking that one of the 
um, services that I can immediately think of where it's it's completely commodified. You know, every rival or competing service is the same is the, the food delivery apps. Uh, you know, there's no, nothing that sets any of them apart generally, except, I guess, when you do have a problem and you need to reach out and ask for help. And, and if you think of then on the support side, what this entails in order to provide this, this help, it's a lot more complex picture because we're not talking about one-to-one relationship. We're talking about one to uh, a brand, the, you know, the, the, the supplier of the, you know, the delivery company, then there is the, the restaurant, then there is the courier, which is often a, a third party. Um, and there might be even, you know, a, a fourth sometimes. So you're getting into all this network of, you know, services and, providers that, that are delivering your food to the door. So uh, what's required from an, the life agent is a lot more and they need a lot of tools. So the other part of what's happening in the industry is all these investments in virtual assistants, in cobots, in scripts for automated knowledge article retrievals, you know, the whole knowledge management side or, or next best actions or next best offer tools or, and different recommendation engines. I mean, there's this whole set of different instruments that are on the market and CX services players are, that I talk to on my Nelson Hall projects are increasingly bringing quite strong examples and implementations of, in the space across different lines of business. Mm, yeah, yeah. That, and it's interesting because you're talking really about the, the role of the agent changing and transforming um, because many of the interactions we're used to, the kind of first line interaction between the customer with a problem and, and the brand, uh, a lot of that's shifting to, to self-service or, or to chatbots um, and especially um, phones with, with Google available immediately and Siri and uh, asking Alexa for help with a problem. Um, by the time the human actually contacts um or a human-to-human -human contact between an agent and the customer, it might be the, the third level of support. So do you, do you think that that starts redefining what, how an agent um, or the profile of an agent? Yes. I mean, if, if you think of what's required to, today to, to effectively uh, support customers, um, it's part of the human within the... The, let's say the a digital journey. So it, it used to be a lot of these investments in, uh, uh, you know, humans interacting during, during sales or, or as we said, or different shopping journey completion. But I'm seeing a lot more programs now adding the, the, the human in proactively in the customer care journey, for example, for, process, for processes that were purely on, on the website. And the, the idea that I said earlier is that companies want to proactively engage with their customers uh, and if if you look at the, the evidence for this, there there are a lot of those. I mean, even at the, the small companies, like let's say a, a small real estate agent in in Greece, you know, they have a chatbot on their website, and you can um, connect through to a, the realtor um, through it, or at least have a callback. So, or, or the other extreme is, you know, you look, look at the technical support. You know, we. Um, the traditional one device, one network, one kind of engineer pairing uh, is kind of outdated. I mean, an effective technical support engineer is able to, to cover the entire environment of interconnected devices you know, from multiple brands. So in your home, you have the router connected to the laptop, but then the smart TV, the smart thermostat, and the security system, you know, the speakers, and you know, your vacuum cleaner, your robot, <laughs> I robot. So any issues that, that you might have can be caused by different parts of the network. So we need as users this comprehensive support and for the agent to offer it, they need a host of different uh, tools in, in their disposal. And I think in the long term, I would love to see kind of this fully universal agent who can provide the level of, I would call it account management, even to mass market programs. And I see this trend kind of shaping up in the SMB uh, segment. Yeah, yeah, that it's interesting because I've seen account management has become really popular as a service for the BPOs to to offer, uh, rather than the more traditional kind of um, problem solving. Um, it's more like pro proactive account management seems to be uh, becoming very popular. 
yeah in the in the small and medium segment definitely i mean think of a a merchant a seller on the large uh, marketplaces whether it's uh, alibaba or uh, amazon or timo in, in china they need support uh, but they need you know uh, counterfeit uh, management they need you know protection for uh, fake goods they need uh, content moderation on their uh, on their shops they need um, you know support on their catalogs in addition to helping them with uh, with pure account management and maybe billing and invoicing and all the things that, that are needed. And, and this happens ac across the board for uh, different services, maybe increasingly, I think even B2B as well. Well, you've talked at some length about the expanding role of the agent, the, the new use of technology to augment the agent, but then also other technologies around the customer, changing the customer journey through smart speakers, search engines, so improved self-service, as well as automation with chatbots, etc. And yet, when companies put out their, their RFPs, it seems that they're still fixated on the, the FTE, the, the, the full-time equivalent cost of having mm. people in the contact center. And yet from everything that you've said, that the human agent in the contact center is now just one component of how you provide a sort of complex CX service. So how come this industry is still so focused on the FTE? As, as pricing. Yes. Well, I mean, gradually this is changing. Um, so... The, the, uh, if, if you put yourself in the, the shoes of, of a CX client, um, the challenge is that, first of all, they face so many unknowns, right? The, the, to predict the market growth, to foresee the customer behavior patterns, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, in, in certain industries. So to commit to those more advanced models uh, is, is actually quite challenging. And what... CX vendors are doing are, are kind of helping in the space with, uh, you know, they're, they're helping with upfront investments um, or, you know, some industry specific benchmarks and, and uh, matrices. They, they integrate their consulting and uh, analytics offering within the managed services side. So there's, there are a lot of instruments for partnership, but still a, a way to go. Um, I, I would say that the indications are that at least if we look into, let's say, two to three years down the road, at least a third of all contracts uh, will have a significant outcome-based element or total cost of ownership or some form of gain share. So uh, I think as an industry, we are we, we can kind of disagree at the pace, maybe, of this change, but not in the direction. Thanks for listening to the CX Files podcast. We really appreciate your feedback and suggestions. You can reach myself, Mark Hillary, or Peter Ryan via LinkedIn. Please also leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast provider, as that helps more people to find us. As always, we'd like to thank Chris Haig at Traction Media for the CX Files graphics. See you next week.